Hello everyone, welcome back to Leading the Standard. I am still Kelly and today we are talking episode 21, Mastering Boundaries, a key to success in auditing and consulting. And it's one that I think a lot of us will be able to relate to. So this week, based on our newsletter 68, which is available on LinkedIn, this is something Jackie and I have been reflecting on recently, especially um, we recently attended a conference in Sydney and boundaries were a kind of a common theme at that event as well and really got us thinking about how essential they are in our roles as auditors and consultants. So Jackie, welcome. Um, this topic actually came out of something you experienced firsthand before the conference was even on our radar uh, and you've spent, obviously, some t- um, years working with businesses. And I know you've seen how easy it is for things to get overly complicated when those boundaries start to blur, even if I suppose there's best of intentions. Um, So it's a tough balance to strike, but an important one. And I think a lot of people will recognise themselves in this episode today. So Jackie, why don't you kick things off by sharing your story and how you navigated this challenge? Over to you. Thank you. Yeah, it is something that we do have to remind ourselves of constantly. And um, I suppose the story that I did share in the Lead the Standard, was it 68, I think you said, um, was about a company, a business that I have been auditing for quite some time, I think three or four certification cycles. So um, most recently, last year actually, um, I I did raise a minor non-conformance uh, for a, a significant gap. Like obviously it wasn't major, but you know it was enough to um, have a non-conformance raised. And this business, because um, one, it's a mature business, and two, it's a mature system. Most recently, particularly in the last cycle, they're not used to um, getting non-conformances. So it wasn't something (laughs) that, you know, they were really prepared for. So they were a bit, you know, a bit in shock. But obviously I went through that process of um, explaining why, gaining their understanding and so on. And it wasn't, and I think initially it was just with the operations manager, but then top management came in into the room as well. And, you know, I re-explained it, et cetera. And really it was top management that said, yeah, absolutely, yeah, that's a huge gap because they saw the risk to the business more so while the operations manager was maybe trying to cover his backside a bit, <laughs> um, which, you know, it's not about the person, but he yeah, he he was, yeah, he, he was taking separate. ownership. Yeah, yeah it, it was his way of owning and recognising, oh, Shoot, I should have been. I should have picked this up, but it was it was top management that said, "Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is a huge gap. We need to get on to this." So, you know, we were at at the meeting table, and I thought, "Okay, my work's done. I've got them to understand um, why." And so I said, "Look, can I just have a you know half an hour just to get my notes in?" So I sort of turned around. Um, on a, another workspace and I was typing, you know, updating my notes. And then, of course, I could still hear the discussion right behind me. And it started to get a little heated. Um, again, I think some people were getting defensive. Um, that felt, yeah, it was their responsibility and they felt bad, etc. that it was missed and they started arguing about how to fix it, why did it happen, you know, all all of these different things. And I could feel myself, I started to turn around to have my two cents worth and then I realised, hold on, turn back around, Jackie, because it wasn't any of my business after that point. Um, I'd... I was there as a certification auditor. I did not work there. Um, I wasn't top management. I wasn't an operations manager. I was a, a completely external party. So I had I pulled myself up because I realised I was going to turn around and then realised, oh, out of scope, Jackie, not, not, not your 
circus, not your monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> Are you calling but, a monkey? <laughs> <laughs> so that's when I thought, yeah, we, and, and I do actually remember this being one of the hardest adjustments that I actually had to make when I did move away from uh, a salary internal position and, yeah. and again, still as an, an internal auditor and a quality environmental manager, in, in that instance, internally, I could continue to be part of the discussion. But I, I really remember when I stepped out of that internal to an external that was a big light bulb moment for me is that, ah, oh, I don't have to get involved in office politics anymore. No. Um, the light not, bulb or was that a bit of a like a party popper moment? Celebration. For you? Yeah. <laughs> it, it is. It's like it's actually, and if you look at it that way, it is actually, oh, I don't need to get involved in that anymore. I'm external. So, think, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so you come in and you do your job. And then, yeah, and then leave. Yeah. But you, you really have to be conscious um, of those boundaries when you move from internal to external. Mm. So, I know, yeah, you, I know, you know that this is say, a, Kelly. Yeah. Go. <laughs> go. Yeah, I think this is one of the things, and I'm glad we're talking about this because we see this every single week um, in our instructor led training assessments. The and no matter how much we've got it written in our content that as an auditor we don't give um, the corrective actions, etc. It's something that I would say, look, easy 75 80% of our ILT students, even though they've got a script or something in front of them, they still want to fill that gap. So I'm glad we're talking about it today. Yeah, 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 you're right. And that's a good way of putting it. You sort of, yeah, you want to fill that gap or. <laughs> Actually, actually, yeah, you're right. Maybe it is about, you know, you want to be part of the solution and mm -hmm. contribute to that. But as auditors, um, particularly yeah. external, um, different obviously if you're a consultant because as a consultant you are there to provide guidance, but you do have to understand whether you're there as an auditor or you're there as a consultant. And sometimes it can cross over. And even as a consultant conducting their internal audits, I always think, and this is my opinion, separate it. Yeah, You're I just agree. finding what they were meant to do. This is what they did and report on the gap, take that hat off and then go, okay, now let's take a look at the corrective action because otherwise the waters get very muddied. So, yeah. um, I, you know, again, as I said, that's my opinion. Um, but definitely if you're moving into the external auditor world, it is none of your business. <laughs> what, like it is your business when you do a follow-up audit and review their corrective action to see whether it um, resolves the issue, but mm. how they come up with it, yeah, you, you know, you, the, how you write up your non-conformances guides them in a certain direction but yeah, as as an external party, there is there are some boundaries. Yeah. Okay. Um, so as I normally do, and I know you always want me to give a short answer before <laughs> I start talking. Um, so like I always do when I need some guidance, I know this is boring, I turn to an ISO standard <laughs> to see if the clause requirements can transfer to support me in a solution and therefore everyone else. So I actually looked at ISO 9001 and look, it I I look at 9001 because it's my it's the overarching yeah. framework. The what I've pulled out of it could be in any of the ISO standards um, and it'll make sense when I explain it. But when I looked in ISO 9001, it dawned on me that there were several already requirements that we could use to help us to establish boundaries as external parties when we go into an organisation. So that's how I came up with the boundaries model. Um, I'm sure, Kelly, you'll put the link to the Lead the Standard um, article that will show that model. Um, this model uses the key requirements from 9001 and, as I said, other standards as well. 
and it helps us as external parties or auditors establish these boundaries and clarify our roles when we're working for organisations. So each of the elements, it serves a different purpose and we will break them down later. But just to give you a summary, there's context, there's interested parties, there's scope, objectives, evaluation and improvement. And all of those together support us in setting our boundaries. Mm. So you're happy with that short answer? <laughs> it was a long short answer, but it's a good short <laughs> answer. <laughs> well, there's a lot going on there. There is. Um, there is. Yeah. So, you know, what is it? One, two, three, four, five. I can't count. Six. <laughs> six okay. different, um, I suppose, influences on that model. So we'll, we can go and break each of them down like we normally do. And you'll see as we start breaking each of them down, they all start linking together anyway. So um, I'll take you down that path. So just to explain further then each of these, I sort of call them key elements, but they could be influences, they could support your boundaries as, as well. But the first key element to setting professional boundaries is context. So understanding the organisational environment, it will help you to define what's expected from you as an external auditor or consultant. It ensures you stay within your role. So understanding the internal and external influences on the business and which areas your expertise, why you're there, it will help you to stay within those boundaries and pull yourself back in when you need to. Yeah. So just like I explained before, this is perfect actually, when I started turning around to have my two cents worth and then I thought, no, Jackie, come back here. <laughs> That's exactly what this, yeah, this describes. Um, you know, there's other things going on like scope as well, which is one which is one of the um the key elements also but I I put context first because it helps to understand what the internal and external influences are and then that drives towards setting that scope mm. it, it is sorry I'm, I'm thinking to myself, it is a cycle but I'm thinking <laughs> that's exactly what you've just drawn yeah and, and mm. again I think we'll discover by the end of today that it isn't just a one-way site. It is, again, that continual mm -hmm. loop. Absolutely, absolutely. And you'll see that if you look at the model in the um, Lead the Standard article, um, just if you want a visual, that's all. So the second key element to setting professional boundaries are the interested parties. So interested parties highlight the importance of knowing the key stakeholders involved and what their expectations are, which helps us as external professionals coming in. It helps keep our interactions, our discussions, our communications focused and within scope. Mm -hmm. This is an interesting one because, again, um, a lot of our students, when we have the conversations around particularly audit interviews, um, I find that people kind of, with their questions, once they've asked their questions, they kind of tend to want to give a solution to that person or when they're introducing themselves at the beginning of their interview, they say, look, we're going to... Um, here today, some ask some questions and find some solutions for you. That's that's not what we're here to do. Um, and again, you don't want to be telling Joe on the warehouse floor, or oh, look, there's other issues in the other departments, and we've got to like, don't mm -hmm. worry, just because you've got you've got an issue here, they've got that over there as well. You mm -hmm. need to again within those boundaries that we just talked about in the context really understand how, as you said, the business works together 
but also who are the who are the appropriate people to be having these conversations yeah. with? So yeah. yes, everyone is an interested party, but just because they're an interested party doesn't mean that they're the right people to be having yeah. these conversations with. Yeah, that's true, and that sort of pulls in um, confidentiality as yeah. well. So um, yeah, understanding who who you should be speaking to, um, and not sort of blabbing to other people, and really. Even it goes twofold. If you if you're blabbing to other people that aren't actually you know part of that area or solution, you've overstepped your boundaries. But it's also a confidentiality thing as well. Mm. So it's it's completely unnecessary. And I know I say this to you a lot, Kelly, and I I said it even last week when we were in Sydney at the conference. It's like prioritize because. Yeah. There's so many things, there's so many exciting things that, you know, you, we can be doing, but it's focus. What is it? We do, Otherwise you're doing all of this stuff everywhere yeah. and you're not staying on track essentially. So really, you know, that's it. all of this, while we talk about boundaries, it is about focus, isn't it? And yeah. priorities. And actually I wrote down, just sorry, just to skip back a little bit, I wrote down earlier was that we aren't here, and this is before I the boy said, we aren't here to finish the story. We're just a character in the first chapter. Oh, yeah, which is a little bit philosophical, but um, very. And I think that that addresses that. Oh, I want to give the solution. We want to mm-hmm. because that doesn't it doesn't feel finished. I guess you, mm. here's a problem. Yeah, and walk away. We need yes. to let the other people do all their things and then we'll come back at the end. Yeah. Right yeah, absolutely. And and really it is, you know, you talk about, um, say, coaching is all about asking the right questions so that the person that you're working with and coaching sort of comes up with the answers themselves. Even though you might know what the answers are, it's about, just asking those right questions so they find their way. And that's what I meant um, before is if you're writing up your non-conformances against the the most compelling criteria and you're writing it up, well, this is what was meant to have happened, this is what I saw, you're actually supporting them and driving them towards the right corrective action or the, the best corrective action anyway. Um, so it's very similar just to about, just like asking the right questions as well. Yeah. So yeah, you're taking them down a path. Yeah. You're not, you're making sure that they follow the right path for them, not the one based on your opinion. Yes. 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 So I think that's a really good point because particularly as an external auditor, it's not, it's our opinion does not come into it. Mm. Like it doesn't mean we don't have our opinions, <laughs> <laughs> but we do have to be very careful. Um, and I'm even within this uh, recording, I think I've already said it, this is my opinion because mm. if I do give my opinion and it's not in a standard or a criteria requirement, I want to make it clear that you won't find this written anywhere. This is just my opinion. So you can agree or disagree. Um, I'm just giving you something to think about. Mm. That's it. Yeah. Giving you something to think about, not the solution. Exactly, exactly. So that's the two so far, which is context and interested parties. So you'll find that this does feed into the third one and we've already touched on it. So the third key element to set professional boundaries is scope. Hmm. So, yeah, both the context and interested parties' outputs will define the scope. So it ensures that you only focus on the areas you are responsible for preventing that overreach, as we've said, into other matters other other discussions essentially so so far the first three context interested parties the outputs from that leads into determining the scope 
So disappointed there weren't your hand gestures here, your scope and boundary. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh the scope. No, what? Yeah, I always do scope. Like scope a fence. and boundaries, yeah. Yeah, a fence around it. So, and that's actually a good point, Kelly, because scope, there's three things. Okay, I hope I remember the number three when I get to it. <laughs> the first way we know scope is um, when we're conducting an audit, okay, and that's what you're referring to when we do our lead audit training. I say scope, what's the scope of the audit, okay? So it could be locations, it could be different departments, different procedures, etc. cetera. Then the second scope is when a business um, implements and maintains their management system. So there's a scope as to, well, this is what our management system covers, the activities, products, services, and locations. Mm -hmm. But then I'm using the word scope here for us as external parties going into an organisation. So it's still the same thing. You know, even, say, in construction, um, they have scope of works. So yeah. what's the scope? So you know what your boundaries are. And so that's, that's how I'm using this word scope as the boundaries for us as external parties. So we need to know what that is. So while we might have, as external auditors, we'll have the scope of the audit that we're conducting, and we'll need to know what the scope of the management system is that we're auditing. We also need to understand what our scope is as external parties. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's not, now I'm thinking of it, that's not normally documented anywhere. But, no. you know, as auditors, external parties, we need to self regulate. And honestly, I, I know I did write a newsletter about this about arrogant the auditor <laughs> yeah I, did we do a podcast on that one too I I can't recall I know that many years ago we did a blog on that as well it's it's a theme that's come up a few times yeah and you do hear these horror stories mm. of particularly and I'm, I'm really sorry um yeah certification auditors that just overstep the mark and, you know, I've had one instance where I've heard that um, the client actually said to the consultant, I need to leave the room because he's talking to you like he's your dad. Oh. Yeah. It's, yeah, there's some shockers. There's yeah. some really, and I apologise because, you know, I would hope that they'd all come through our training and we sort of... <laughs> kick that out manage of that a little <laughs> bit um yeah. but yeah it, it's really yeah that's really stepping outside the boundaries when we're not here this particular I call him arrogant the auditor um yeah he he then commenced giving the consultant a training session oh yeah it, it yeah really bad um yeah yeah, so, you know, if you're out there and you've experienced this, it shouldn't be like that. You should uh, let the certification body know what's going on. So, you know, this scope helps us, and that's, that's where I was going with this. We need to self-regulate. We are professionals, mm -hmm. and, you know, part of our um, learning, the qualifications, uh, particularly, say, even when uh, if we go up the path of personnel certification with exemplar global there's codes of conduct yeah so um actually there's a improvement <laughs> sorry i just had no notes <laughs> went oh interesting i i think it would be great to add a code of conduct to In our content yeah brilliant yeah. But, but regardless of the code of conduct there are the principles and personal behaviors and they are documented absolutely the guidelines for auditing management systems. Yeah, I wonder how that covers scope because it's very soft skills focused. Mm. But the, I yeah. think 
there, there's a couple of elements in there. And sorry, I'm just going to jump back. I'm going to share a similar story to yours. Not as bad as yours, because that was awful. I can't imagine someone in a professional space doing that. Um, but I, again, had a student talking to me. She wanted to get into auditing because she'd had a bad experience and uh, she wanted to understand that. Mm -hmm. Now, she had um, experienced an audit. It was a management systems audit and it was purely on um, the, it was in the education sector. And this auditor could not find any non-conformances in their space so they went into another department and somehow started picking at the students so they were looking they were asking students for id so they could cross check um edge yeah that was the face that i pulled mm -hmm. um but not only that getting into legislative concerns because yeah. she couldn't find anything wrong and she had to um give them things that they needed to fix i'm like well there's better ways to do that. You don't need to find a non-conformance to create these dramas. Again, sticking within the scope but knowing the boundaries. You're yeah. not there yeah, to be. Absolutely, yeah. That sounds like they were outside the scope of the audit. Audit yeah. on a loan, mm. but, yeah, but they've certainly crossed some professional boundaries mm. there as well. Yeah, yeah. They, look, you know, it, it does happen that there's no non-conformances, but there's always observations and improvement opportunities. And that's the better way. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, you're coming in with fresh eyes and a different perspective. So, um, you know, yeah, I, I, I've I left audit, yeah, with no non-conformances and just improvement opportunities or observations before. Yeah, it's a credit to the company that they've, they've Absolutely. put in the time and the effort. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so I think, yeah, the scope I think is a big thing and possibly when I created the boundaries model I could have just skipped straight to scope but, you know, the context and the interest of parties feeds into that scope. So mm -hmm. I was trying to, yeah, demonstrate, I suppose, you know, those um, outputs and inputs for all. So that's the first three. All right, the fourth key element to set professional boundaries is all about objectives. So clear goals help you stay aligned with the purpose of your external role and it avoids <laughs> those distractions from office politics. So you can see we're narrowing it down. Context, interested parties, scope, and now objectives, it's sort of coming down the funnel and it's giving us these smaller boundaries. Mm -hmm. So with objectives, again, we talk about that in a management system. We talk about that in the context of an audit. So, you know, always the objective of an audit is to something like to determine the extent of conformance to the agreed criteria and to identify improvement opportunities. That's a great objective for the auditor to also take into consideration, don't you think? I think that is a very clear boundary. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, That's right. I don't think I don't think there's much room for fence hopping in this situation. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I went up that path. It's like before we conduct these audits, the objective scope and criteria is always set. So for us as external parties and, you know, self-regulating and keeping ourselves on track, those three things that are always part of the audit requirements, they're the main three things that will keep you on track and the objective of the audit will keep you on track and aligned with where you have to head. The criteria is another thing, um, so what you're actually auditing against. We talked about scope, so the scope can go into those three, three factors, but all three will influence us, won't they? That they're, they're, they're key. I, as... As I'm preparing for an audit, like the objective normally stays the same, 
The only thing that might change is the scope. So there might be an additional activity or location that I need to be aware of. And the criteria could change as to what I'm auditing against. But those three help me from the from the context of the overarching audit stay on track. You know, of course, there's other personal behaviour things that we need yeah. to be aware of, which is like the story that I shared is a perfect example. The objective scope and criteria of the audit wouldn't have been enough to shut me up to turn around <laughs> and stop yeah. myself from giving my opinion. It was yeah. awareness of my own personal behaviours as an external party that made me turn back around and not get involved. Here's a question for you. How would you have handled that if they had said, Jackie, what do you think? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, because um, as an external auditor, I can't tell them mm. what I think. Um so yeah, it, it's it, you. You need to explain those boundaries, and normally you would do that at an opening meeting. But it does come up, so you know you, you do say, "Look, I'm here to audit. I'm not. I'm not able to provide a solution. Um, this is the requirement. You say you do this, or the criteria says to do this. You say you do this in your systems. That's those three levels." but this is what I've seen. So you need to determine how to fill the gap. Sometimes I might go, I do, I have seen it done this way. However, it might not fit in with you. It depends on what my relationship with them is, but um, yeah, I have seen it done this way. I certainly don't. And this is what an auditor used to do when I was an internal auditor. Um, the quality environment OHS for Sunwater many years ago, our external auditor used to send me templates of, of registers and tables and documents that I could use in the system as an improvement. Oops. Yeah, oops. I didn't say anything. I was name. getting I was getting free templates. And look, <laughs> I, I was I was young and still learning and um yeah I I would definitely say something now, 20, 25 years later, but I guess, you know, he was an older, more experienced person and I was eager to learn more. So I was sort of taking it in. But, yeah, on reflection, as now the older, experienced <laughs> person, what he was doing was just, yeah, completely he was overstepping boundaries. He if, if he was um, audited by Jazans. Um, it that would be a non-conformance. Uh, yeah. You know, that's something that they they look for when they audit us as external auditors is that that we're not consultants. And I think that's an important. Again, I, we keep skipping backwards this week rather than forwards. Um, it's it's important to understand as an auditor that that is you have a responsibility to lead by example because twenty mm -hmm. year old Jackie doesn't know any better, and yeah. you're setting an example. And the next auditor might come in and go, "Sorry, you need to figure this out for yourself." Oh, but yeah, Bob gave me all the information last time. Oh, Bob, you're yeah. in trouble. Now. So yeah. you have a responsibility to your auditee to not lead them down the garden path but allow them to find their feet find the right yeah. thing for them yeah that's it yeah that's a good point because yeah we were always going to have those dynamics with yeah more experienced um people in this space in this industry with younger ones coming on eager to learn so yeah we need to sort of set them on the right path sooner rather than later put it you're that also way. creating more work for yourself too by going back to the mm. office doing all that template no mm. done, walk away the report's yeah, enough <laughs> not as yeah that's right it, yeah there's more to yeah his story um <laughs> the, the stuff that 
in mm. hindsight when I look back with some experience, go, hmm, I don't know if that was quite right. But um, you know, you will come you will come across it. So I suppose I mean, haven't looked at it this way. We're coming uh, into this topic from the the context of an external party. But if you're listening to this, if you're an internal party and you have an external party behaving badly, <laughs> <laughs> um, then at least you'll be able to understand, oh, hold on a second, I don't think that's up to you, mate, um, or yeah. Yeah, that's out, out. Out, yeah, out of scope. So, um, you know, that's something I know our students say with our lead auditor training is that not only have they learnt the principles and processes of conducting an audit, they've also learnt what's expected when they're an auditee and what to expect from the auditor as well. So in the same instance, I think this is also beneficial. So if you're listening to this, yeah, this will help you to understand what they, you know, this external auditor or external party should actually be focusing on. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's good, yeah, okay. good to hear that you have, as an auditor, you too have boundaries that you're allowed mm. to. Mm. Um, okay. We have two more key elements to wrap this cycle up. The fifth key element to set professional boundaries is all around evaluation. So regular evaluation of your interactions, it helps ensure you're maintaining the correct boundaries. So I started laughing then because that's exactly what I I did. I regulated myself <laughs> um, in the story I told because I went to go and give my opinion and then I stopped myself and turned. I actually physically did start to turn around and then turn myself back. So I was evaluating myself on the go <laughs> to go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, mm, mm, no, nah, no, nah, come back. <laughs> so and that's, I, I suppose, we're only human. Yeah. And you will get wrapped up in things. And, look, it's probably because they were all being very passionate about it and they were you know I, I actually love that they were passionate about the gap and they knew how important it was that they get onto it so they were probably drawing me in um mm -hmm. so I was being being pulled in and I wanted to be part of that but I yeah I I, I couldn't so that was that evaluation so it's okay as you know, if you find yourself overstepping the mark, it's never too late to pull yourself back and go, oh, hold on a second, I've just realised. You know, as I said, we're all human. So um, it, it, I used that before. If if I have something to say, I'll always say it's my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, I need to make that clear. This is my opinion. So, you know, don't quote a standard or anything on it. So it's okay if you over if you overstep or you pick yourself up mm -hmm. so actually I was gonna that leads into the yeah. last one <laughs> but before I do that have you got anything to add to evaluate no because I want to I want you to hit this last one because I do have something to say but it it covers both of them together yeah so, I know yeah. and that's I think that's where I was heading I went to go uh, oh, oh. You I was overstepping the situation the and then came yeah. back inside the boundaries. Come back, Jackie. Stay on track. So evaluate is that first step. You've done, you've you've taken into consideration the other four key elements. Now it's checking in on yourself. Okay. So therefore, the sixth and final key element to set professional boundaries is improvement you probably guessed it so continually checking in that your boundaries and scope are being applied it's normal for there to be scope creep as long as you are aware and can can professionally pull yourself back in mm -hmm. 
So that's where I was heading, Kelly, when yeah. I was talking about evaluation. It, it naturally leads, leads to improvement. And I started actually talking about improvement essentially because it is, oops, we've checked in. Now pull yourself back. And, you know, I also Thank share you. this after every audit I do, I actually give myself improvement that's where notes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. And um, I'm pretty sure if I pulled up my improvement notes for this client that I tell this story about, it, that would be in it because I picked up, well, that was easy to come back into. And and now that I think about it, it's always with these clients because they're very passionate and I love that. So, I want, yeah, as I said, I want to be a part of it, um, which is quite interesting because it does, I suppose you do get influenced by the people, don't yeah. you? Yeah. You know. How would you yeah. be if they were not, you know, like, You'd much rather a passionate, excited, so, well, well, not, they didn't sound very excited. They were very passionate but disheartened, I guess, rather yes. than a, a client who's pushing back, going that's wrong and getting all defensive in a different mm. way. And even that would be, I feel like that would be easier to say no to, somebody being defensive and aggressive rather than someone showing passion who you really want to help and like clearly yeah. they want to improve. So, yeah, I think that's yes. an interesting dynamic. Yes, yes. No, I, I've had that light bulb moment now because, yeah, we, even with that client, there's probably been other things and it's like you, you're constantly getting pulled <laughs> in. Yeah, I th I'm sure I've said to them, if I wasn't doing this, I'd like to come and work for you because <laughs> 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 it's just such a, yeah, a great culture. So, you know, and, and you do have those uh, personality matches and fits as well and the opposite also where, you know, you're, you're working as an external party in, an, in a company but their culture isn't sort of aligned with yours and that it just isn't a good fit. So it's quite uncomfortable whereas it's the comfortable ones that you might find yourself overstepping the mark yeah yeah and I that's been a light bulb moment for me actually talking it through I think that's what it is when oh what are they doing to me they're making me <laughs> feel comfortable I can see what they're doing <laughs> <laughs> that you're they're doing it on purpose just to make sure you give them your two cents worth <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah I, I suppose that is something that we do have to be aware of Mm. so that's the how many did I say six six, six. and I call them key go. elements that surround boundaries and as you've said Kelly they it's a continual cycle so like the last one was improvement and that will feed back into context interested parties it may you know change the scope and set your objectives and then you just keep checking yourself but all of those will help us to stay on track so the six were context interested parties scope objectives so here's the funnel it's narrowing down if you want a different view so context interested parties scope and objectives and then we evaluate it. How's all that going? Set some improvements and refill the funnel again. Just keep filling the funnel, filling it, and just working our way through. Just so we're setting those um, parameters. So, as always, before I hand it back to Kelly, I'd like to close with stay curious and always lead the standard. By staying curious and leading the standard, you'll continually find new opportunities for growth and excellence in your career. Thank you, Jackie. I love that emphasis on continually. That's been a point of discussion. It has. <laughs> yes, this <laughs> week. Um, very interesting. Um, yes, that is a wrap for today's um, episode of Lead the Standard. Thank you, Jackie. Hopefully um, everyone got some practical insights about how to set boundaries and how that can really make a difference in the auditing and consulting world. Um, as I said earlier, it is something that we all have to navigate. And let's be honest, staying in your lane isn't always easy, but it is ever so important. Um, before we do sign off today, 
uh, just a little teaser for next week. We will be looking at episode 22. Where has that time gone? Um, safety as a lifeline, how ISO 45001 can transform workplace well-being. This will be interesting, something less Ooh. quality and a whole Ooh. new standard to talk about. So if workplace safety and well-being are on your radar, as they should be, you definitely do not want to miss next week's episode. So thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you. Thanks for joining us once again as we lead the standard. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast for more episodes just like this. And don't forget to leave a review if you found today's episode informative and inspiring. If you're already an ATOL student, remember participating in live Q&A sessions just like this is one of the exclusive perks of your enrolment. And if you're not already a student, join us at our website www.auditortrainingonline.com to learn more about our courses and how you can start making a difference in your career in ISO management system standards. So join us again next week as we not just meet the standards, but we lead them.